Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. Now, let's jump into the episode. Hello, and welcome to the Novik Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Ovori. Today, we are going to be diving into one of the OGs of the Web3 space and one of the most sustainable Web3 businesses out there. Our subject today is So Rare, the French company that has pretty much cornered the market in football or soccer for our American listeners, collectible trading card games slash fantasy sports. Uh, the game is based on a very simple concept, which So Rare has refined since it launched in 2018, 2019. The game is essentially a form of fantasy football or soccer that makes use of player trading cards, which are, of course, NFTs. Players construct a team of five players, each occupying different positions using the NFT cards they own. The aim is to score points based on these players' real-life match performances over a three- to four-day period. So Rare also hosts tournaments and leaderboard contests with the opportunity to win rare cards, and in some cases, even cash prizes, which are paid out in crypto. The company generated over over 300 million in secondary market sales in 2022, and just under 90 million in the first five months of 2023, according to CryptoSlam. And we can have our guest confirm or deny this. So while the volumes are down during the crypto winter we are currently in, so Rare is clearly sustaining much better than other Web3 games or NFT collections. Furthermore, the company has successfully secured multiple funding rounds, the most recent being a 680 million Series B, which valued the company at $4.3 billion in September 2021. And we at Novik recently covered So Rare in a Novik Digest article, which you should totally subscribe to. Link in show notes. And I have personally been wanting to cover So Rare for quite some time now. Uh, so on the heels of the Novik Digest article, it seemed like the perfect time to do so. So on the pod today, we have two guests. Uh, first, we have the author of the recent Novik Digest article uh, on So Rare. It's our very own Devin Becker. Devin, welcome to the pod. Thanks. Thanks. Happy to be here. And we also have a very special guest with extra insights. Uh, that is Brian O'Hagan, who is the Chief Growth Officer at SoRare. Brian, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Amin and Nico. Appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that intro out of the way, let's get right into it. And I would like to start with uh, a question for our guests about the journey into Web3. Uh, and so let's start with Brian here. Um, what was your journey into Web3? How did you end up at SoRare? Um, so it's, it's a long story, so I'll try to keep it short, uh, short and sweet. Um, but really, I um, you know, discovered Bitcoin 2014-15 uh, through a great entrepreneur called Ventus Caceres. Um, um, and then I uh, just really wanted to kind of start becoming obsessed with, you know, crypto, Bitcoin, you know, falling down the rabbit hill, all that, all that shabam. And um, and started working full time in the industry in 2017 in a place in Paris called La Maison du Bitcoin. Uh, so it was a Bitcoin center that had opened in France um, in 2014, 15. It was opened by the Ledger founders. It was it was that's where Ledger was created um, during the first hackathon in that house of Bitcoin. And um, and so I was I joined the company there, spent some bunch of time there. Um, we were kind of the um, you know the cap like the main place where all the crypto community in Paris and France or anyone who would go through France would would hang out, um, doing lots of events and and it's through that that you know we uh, uh, co-organized with the Sora founders uh, the first event around NFTs um, in Paris in 2018, and um, and from that you know kind of uh, joined the company uh, Sora after. Because I'm passionate uh, about football and about crypto, and so um, you know, so it was the perfect, perfect opportunity. And to be honest, it was the first time I understood um, NFTs um, and why NFTs could be interesting. So um, I'll deep dive a bit later uh, into that. But uh, but yeah, that's the short story. No, you did you did great. That was a very succinct um, uh, intro into into how you got there. I. I, I... I actually have a very similar background. I'm extremely, I'm European originally from Finland and extremely passionate about football 
soccer for our American listeners. Um, I've been playing a game called Football Manager, which nice, uh, yeah, great since game. 1992, which is the the year that the game actually launched, and I have played it every single season uh, since then. And uh, did you not play Championship Manager? I did. Well, originally it was called Championship Manager back in the okay. in the day, and then they changed yeah. their name uh, to Football Manager uh, to yeah. be a bit more appealing, I guess, to to, to broader audience. So, um, to me, the so rare story, you know, football trading cards, the, the stats, like the heavy uh, leaning into the the data um, and ownership on blockchain, to me, makes a ton of sense. Um, so, to me, so rare. I wish I had done so rare. <laughs> Um, back in 2018 or, you know, even earlier. Um, but, uh, I totally get that journey. So, um, follow up for Brian here. So let's talk a little bit about the so rare origin story. So, you know, that's your story about how you got into, into crypto and, uh, into so rare itself. Uh, what's the so rare origin story? Like how did the founders come up with the concept? Why did they choose blockchain for, for ownership? Um, and most importantly, I think, how did a startup company uh, get the licenses <laughs> that you need uh, in order to obviously have real player stats, real imagery, real names, uh, real ownership um, over that. Really curious to hear that story. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they were, so the two founders, uh, Nico and Adrien, they were, um, so actually the, the CEO and co-founder is called Nico uh, with a C. Um, and um, they met at their previous blockchain enterprise company called Stratum in Paris. Um, and so they were kind of looking um, at, you know, potentially launching something together um, end of 2017. And, and you know, they saw the uh, the rise of, you know, non fungible tokens. And at the time was, you know, CryptoKitties was all over the place. Um, um, and, you know, for instance, I was amongst the people who just really didn't get CryptoKitties, I didn't understand why people would spend, you know, thousands on cats on the blockchain. I was like, this is a stupid concept. Uh, but Nico and Adrien, you know, unlike me, were a lot smarter and they, you know, understood and realized that, hey, this is the uh, the first time you can create unique digital property that has, you know, um, you know, where you can see exactly what, what amount of scarcity uh, for every single object, et cetera, et cetera. And so they thought, as football fans, listen, there is, I think, I think actually where they started is they were both, they both two crypto enthusiasts um, and, you know, crypto, they were working in that, in that, in that industry and they wanted to build a product that kind of um, ex- told the crypto story for you without having to explain it, without having to talk about censorship resistance, what a blockchain is, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, to be able to popularize crypto, we need to build a consumer product. And what better consumer product than a product that is about uh, art, culture, sports? Um, and you know, basically, as football fans, they realize that you know we've always collected um, sports cards, um, but we've never been able to collect online. Um, and with this new technology, non fungible technology, we can now create you know unique digital objects that. Um, um, and, and bring that you know these official licenses to these unique digital objects, and and so that's where they started in their thinking. But then they always thought, listen, the the, the, the thing with you know tops cards or Panini, etc., is that it's really cool to collect, but you don't really use them. You don't engage with these objects. And so here, since this object will be digital, like we can actually make it usable, um, and we can make it usable in in, in a game. Um, and so these are more than just collectibles, they are also in-game items um, in a fancy uh, sports game, in a fancy football game or soccer game. Um, and so the simple concept is like fancy football is like, you know, you you compose uh, a team of, uh, of players um, and based on what these players do in, re- in the real, in real life, um, you collect a certain number of points. Um, and the difference between a, a traditional fancy football game like um, you know, uh, fancy Premier League, which has like 15, 10 million users uh, last year, I think. Um, and so is that, you know, the players in Sower are personified by a, a, a trading card and that trading card is backed by an NFT, an unfungible token. Um, and so it's really the intersection of, you know, collectibles and fancy games put together uh, through, um, you know, with uh, an infrastructure of, 
uh, non-fungible tokens. Um, and I'd say from day one, their thinking was, we're not selling a technology. We are using a technology that will help service a better user experience in a game. Um, and that's always been, you know, the kind of guiding philosophy of, of the team, of the product. Um, and then, you know, maybe to come back to your question, um, how did, you know, how did it work at the beginning? Um, well, the company was, you know, uh, officially created in, in October 2018, was launched in, you know, in Alpha or beta, Alpha was launched in March 2019. Um, and then like the beta really opened to everybody, I think, in uh, end of 2019. And the first license they were able to get was the Belgium Pro League license. And the simple story of how they got that was, you know, Nico got a few interviews left and right with different leagues. Um, and, um, you know, he got a, a business meeting with the chief business officer of the Belgium Pro League. And uh, I think the chief business officer was expecting Nico, was expecting a phone call for 30 minutes. And actually Nico took the train from Paris to Brussels um, and she knocked on the door really and was, you know, it's just like showed up um, and literally like, you know, was really, really motivated and didn't have a product, didn't have maybe even a company at the time when he was pitching this to him. Uh, just He just had a deck and a lot of energy and a lot of, uh, I guess, perseverance and perseveration. And so um, the Belgian Pro League was, was um, probably didn't un understand all the ins and outs of that technology as anyone would, you know, or would not in 2018. But, you know, they took a bet on on him um, nearly as, you know, a, a venture capital company would to some extent. Um, and they basically sold the license to uh, the image rights of the Belgian Pro League, meaning all the all the players, all the clubs, um, to uh, to Nico and Adrien. And, and they were able to start iterating and testing with, with that first license. I absolutely love that story. Uh, yeah, that's the origin story of, of companies, especially ones where you're doing something with literally nothing and you're pitching a vision just like you would to a, you know, a VC, uh, but to a, you know, a, a business entity or, or, you know, a professional league that it, it's, it's really hard. Um, and so I'm so glad that we got this origin story, uh, out there because, uh, yeah, gives me goosebumps, you know, as a, as a founder myself, like gives me goosebumps to, to kind of think through how that experience must have been in those early days, right? The, the, the energy, the excitement, the tingle that you get when you get that first, like, oh my God, we have the Belgian pro license. Like we can actually use real images. We can actually use real names. We can use real stats. Mm -hmm. Um, very, very exciting. So thank you very much for sharing that story. Um, all right, we're going to, um, Head over to Devin here. So I, I acknowledge that uh, we haven't heard from Devin yet um, on this pod. So Devin, uh, obviously you covered uh, so rare in, in the uh, the recent Novic Digest article. Uh, it was a great piece. Uh, I learned a lot from it, and that was the you know the impetus for for having this episode and bringing Brian on as well. Um, one of your main takeaways from that piece, the Novic Digest piece, was that so rare appears to be more sustainable than most, if not all, Web three games or even Web three you know, products overall. Um, how did you reach that conclusion? What were kind of the, what was your thought process in, in, in getting to that point? Not just the revenue numbers, um, because, you know, revenue numbers obviously speak for themselves, but also the, the, the core gameplay, like how do you see so rare compared to perhaps the rest of the web three, uh, landscape? Yeah. I mean, the, the, I, I like the simplest definition, I think of a sustainable game is just, can you make enough money to keep the game going revenue wise? And can you keep enough players to, to keep like interested people actually playing it? I mean, in theory, that could be one player and that player could be paying enough to, you know, keep the game running. But in the case of, of this particular type of game, right? Like the players are going to be evergreen because it's, it's real world sports. Fantasy sports is certainly not going anywhere. So like you've already got the players and just assuming they don't go somewhere else. Right. And then revenue wise, the game actually has a business model that makes sense where it's like, Hey, uh, you know, a lot of these fantasy sports things are a little bit more like say on the gambling side of, you know, things like DraftKings and stuff like that. Whereas this is more on the collectible side, you're buying the players as opposed to like just picking them and following point restrictions and other stuff like that. So there is like an actual monetization and it, almost in a way, a, a sort of pay to win in the sense of like, you're buying the players that you think will help make you win. And there's an auction format. So therefore like there is an element of competitive spending 
to get the, the potentially the best players. And that drives potential revenue. And you've got seasonal models, people buying stuff over and over. So like the entire revenue model like makes sense from an ongoing perspective. And the other really important thing, I think that just a lot of these Web3 games, you know, just didn't really get, especially around Axie and stuff like that, is putting everything on a token is not a great way to to have it sustainable because if that token value changes, that could drastically impact players' interest, players' ability to play, all these things. Whereas this game just being like, hey, it's based off Ethereum. Like the focus is entirely on the collectible cards, which is where it should be. And like the, the Ethereum is just there to facilitate like the in and out of the transactions in a way that's not like real cash. And I think that was the smartest approach, just keeping it really simple and focusing on like the parts of the the game that actually mattered made it more sustainable. And of, and of course, you know, like they've continued to update the game, trying to do things to keep it sustainable, like moving to a layer two network where they could keep, you know, the gas costs a little more sustainable, things like that, just being smart about it. And, uh, you know, being uh, adding more sports and things like that to keep expanding the interest from players in a, in a business model that just makes sense. Yeah, you know, one of the things that that struck me uh, from your piece, Devin, in particular, and, and I'm so glad we have Brian here to either confirm or deny <laughs> um, some some of the uh, the analysis that you, you did was how simple the the model really is, right? Like it's really really simple. It's very straightforward in a, in a good way, right? I mean this as a as a like it's not trying to come up with crazy tokenomics, you know, like a a two token system, <laughs> you know, which they have their 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 benefits i guess <laughs> but but in many ways it, it makes it more complicated and it makes it more you know difficult for the developers and for the participants in the economy and and the game itself um to understand what's going on and, and to your point devin if the price of the token drops drastically um or you've designed the tokenomics in a way that's you know unsustainable or ponzi-esque uh, dare i say uh use that phrase here um it it totally devalues the entire ecosystem, right? You're, you're like, no matter how good your game is or how fun your game is, like you're, you're kind of devaluing the entire ecosystem if, if you do that. So I want to ask you, Brian, um, how conscious were those choices early on um, when you guys decided like, hey, we're going to base this on Ethereum. We're not going to have our own token, not two tokens, not even one token. Um, we're just going to base this on Ethereum. We will do the NFT piece, right? Digital ownership of these trading cards. We will have rarity, which is very deliberate, by the way, and, and Devin and or Brian, you can both speak to this, uh, you know, the different classes of rarity that you have, like the Erling Holland emails that I get on a regular basis uh, to, <laughs> to, to, to buy those. Uh, I still haven't, uh, you know, I think they're like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 at the moment. So a little, little pricey for, for, my, for my liking. But um, the question really here is, how conscious was that choice of keeping the gameplay loop really, really simple early on and not doing your own token? There must have been pressure internally and even externally from your, your investors. I mean, I've certainly heard this story from, from other founders who have launched Web3 companies. Like, hey, you should do your own token. You should do your own token. You should do your own token. You should have a dual token system. What made you guys stick to that simplicity and really not go down the path that so many others followed, almost everybody else in Web3 followed, which is, hey, we're going to do our own token or even two tokens. Yeah, so, um, you know, just to jump on the investor pressure, I think um, actually what's interesting with Sora is that the pre-seed investors, um, very few came from the crypto world, despite, you know, Sora, you know, having a crypto mm. technology and a NFT technology. And I think to some extent it, it was also because it was a product that you know, a lot of people have told me so it was kind of web 2.5 rather than being a true mm. web 3 product and 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 i think it was in kind of like a you know first of first of all like the pre seed was raised in in 2018 starting 2019 so that was bear market uh times like pretty hard to fundraise back then um and second of all i think you know the product wasn't really the exciting kind of thesis at that moment, which was more focused around maybe DeFi and more focused around um, ICOs, et cetera. And so I think crypto investors were not that interested in that in that kind of product. They really understand where we're going with it. Um, uh, but it all comes back to the idea that, yes, when when Sora launched initially, uh, the, 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 the alpha, the closed alpha, um, Actually, a lot of the early users of Sower were other 
interested crypto gaming, sports crypto gaming kind of audience. So uh, there was a, a nerdier game than so in the, I would say, in the, the sports gaming um, crypto industry, which was um, MLB champions. And a lot of the early SOAR users were ex-MLB champion users who were, I would say, unsatisfied with the MLB champion experience and who came to SOAR to try another form of, you know, sports gaming crypto. Um, so that was quite interesting for us because we had our early kind of user base where we could test a lot of things. Um, but always in the back of the mind of the founders was the idea that, hey, this game that we're building is for the wider population of people interested in football gaming or NBA gaming, if we launch NBA one day, or, or MLB gaming, you know, all these, and that's a massive audience. And, 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 and the idea was always, you know, from day one to bring non-crypto users to this product. And so how can we try and onboard these non-crypto users to this product in the, in the easiest way possible? Um, and a, a simple example is, you know, yes, the kind of um, payment infrastructure, um, the Rails is, is based around, you know, ETH. Um, but the, we never, first we were on a, a layer two and then we had to, which was called Loom Network. And then we had to go on, on layer one because Loom Network was closing and so we went to Ethereum, but we always subsidized the fees for transactions on Sower so that as a user, you didn't, know, you didn't need to know what um, MetaMask was, what signing, signing, uh, you know, like a contract was, et cetera, et cetera. And so that allowed us to onboard non-crypto users to the game. And very quickly, we tried to bring in, you know, fiat possibilities to buy cards. Um, so since like early 2020, you can buy, you know, Sora cards, hence like, you know, NF, Sora NFTs with um, Stripe directly since like early 2020. And, and that's always been like, you know, our guiding philosophy. And so when we saw obviously all the kind of interests uh, driven into, um, you know, Web3 gaming tokens such as Axies, we were like, this is, you know, this is super cool, but it's not for us because it's not solving a game mechanic problem that we have. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we could launch a token and potentially, you know, make money and, and potentially try and find a utility for that token. But, it didn't, you know, it wasn't, it was never a need for us. It was never, a lot. we never needed, you know, nor the money, nor the, nor, nor we had the utility uh, of a token that, that had monetary value. So, um, yeah, I mean, for us, the, the, the monetary aspect is just, you can, you know, trade these cards, um, you know, collect them, buy them, sell them, and that's it. Um, and then it's all about what do I do with these cards? Um, um, you know, I can put them in an album. I can, I can, you know, play the kind of more collectible game. I can play the more fancy game now. Um, I can potentially use these cards outside of Sora, et cetera. So um, how can we make it as simple as possible for someone who's interested in football gaming, like you, Nico, uh, who's coming from championship manager, football manager, fancy Premier League, and who doesn't have any crypto knowledge? Like, you know, can, can they onboard in Sora? And that was our guiding philosophy. And it still is. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that kind of cleanliness, if you will, um, of the approach where it's, it, you know, it's just about, you know, Dapper Labs with uh, Top Shot obviously took a similar-ish approach, um, but they they kind of, to me at least, this is my personal opinion, uh, editorializing here, they missed the gaming aspect of it, right? Like it was the the beauty of the, 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 the moments was amazing. Right. And the, you know, the, the videos and the, the, the clips, like they did a great job with that, but then there was that like, okay, now what do I do with these things? Right. You know, I can collect them, but I don't actually have anything I can do with them. Um, and I, I, I know other people who feel the same way here. I think what you've done in my opinion, quite well is it's not just like, okay, I can collect these things and there's this, you know, rarity and there's, you know, the commons and the, the ultra rares, the Erling Hollands of the world. Um, but I can also use them. I can play with them. I can actually, you know, the utility comes from not financial necessarily, but from gameplay um, value. And I think you've you've done a really nice job of just keeping it really, really clean um, and not going down that token rabbit hole. Um, so to that point, let's talk a little bit about the gameplay itself. Uh, we haven't actually fully covered, like, how does the game itself actually work, right? So you've got these 
these cards. You've got various classes of rarity uh, for these different players. Obviously, there's different levels of skill, you know, that's reflected in the real world. And I love, by the way, I definitely want to touch on this, the real world component to this, where how well the players play in the real world actually reflects upon what happens in the game. And I think that's to me, at least, that's one of the, the key aspects of this. So I'm going to ask both of you guys. So I'm going to start with Devin because you know you're the analyst. You did the piece. Um, you, you you looked at this from a kind of outsider's perspective. What is the core game loop? How does it work? What keeps people coming back on a daily basis, weekly basis? Um, and you know, in a nutshell, why is this fun? Right? Well, why is this game fun? Why are people coming back to it? It's interesting because it's it, like I mentioned some of the, the traditional like fantasy sports, like you know DraftKings and stuff like that, that you know are very popular. But this has a, a pretty different twist to it in that those games were generally about uh, picking players and being strategic within, like say, point limits and things like that. This still technically has that to an extent, but it's really about buying, collecting, trading the players and that sort of secondary market aspect. And so, like, there's there's both a game and a meta game at the same time, right? The the game is is picking the team putting together the team based off of what you think is likely to, or who, who you think rather is likely to perform that given week, uh, as well as anticipating who might perform in the future, who might get injured and not be able to play all those sorts of things, but also playing the metagame of the market at the same time where you're like st- strategizing, like who's undervalued, who can I buy for cheap? Oh, Hey, I think this guy I have who's kind of expensive right now actually isn't going to perform. I can sell him, take that money and use it to buy someone else that I think will do better. And so that aspect of like team management from a financial standpoint and a, and a player trading standpoint is that actually adds to the, the gameplay of just picking players for a given weekend. And I always think back to like people that, that probably loved Moneyball. It's, it's mm. so that that movie in that aspect of like, how can I budget this? Because in a regular fantasy sport is, is budgeting off of the points and this it's sometimes budgeting off your actual wallet. And I think that's like a, a really interesting take on it because you have to be smarter than the other players in a lot of ways. And, and so there's, you know, even the social aspect of it that involves in that, uh, that loop of picking those players. That's, that's really sticky for sports fans to have these kind of discussions. Cause you think back to one of the most exciting parts of a lot of fantasy sports is that draft pick, right? The, that part of the season where people are trading players, picking players, making deals, that sort of things happening continuously within this game in a way that regular fantasy sports doesn't have because there's not really player trading. There's not really negotiation. It's just maybe head to heads like strategy, but, but that's about it. And I think that's what makes this game particularly compelling is those two things combined. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, I think yeah, what's interesting to me is is this idea of the rarity piece, right? Because if you have a normal fantasy game, anybody can own, you know, Tom Brady or, you know, Lionel Messi or whatever, depending on what sport you have, right? As long as you're within the cap, right? Like you've got to follow the rules, but anybody can have that player on their team. And I think what makes Sora so interesting to me and, and what makes NFTs as applied to a fantasy sports game that interesting is that rarity aspect. Um, you know, not, not everybody can own Erling Holland, right? Like only a certain number of people can own Erling Holland. And this goes back to kind of your, your point earlier, Devin, you said pay to win. I don't think in a pejorative way, I don't think you were talking about it being a bad thing at all. It's just a very clear way of playing the game and knowing like, Hey, I have Erling Holland. Only a hundred people can have him on, on their team. We know he's a superstar. Um, and that is going to make my team better. And that has monetary value if I'm a game player that values this type of gameplay. So Brian, talk to me about that. Clearly, there was an explicit choice, right? Like, you know, you, you touched on this briefly uh, in your intro, but using NFTs and that digital ownership and that rarity piece, and it's in your ra- name, so rare, soccer rare, uh, sorare, if you're Italian. Um, but that rarity aspect, I think, is that's the piece that's really different as it relates to NFTs and Web3 compared to a kind of air quotes traditional fantasy sports game. And that to me is the nugget that makes so rare interesting. And that's what makes, you know, these cards valuable as long as you have a fun, fun game. So talk to me a little bit about how that insight came to be and how you guys are leaning into that rarity aspect um, without it being and feeling like a pay to win in the pejorative sense, if you know what I mean, right? Um, like, you know, th- there is there is that criticism sometimes of like, oh, if you just pay more than the next guy, you can, 
you know, win the game, beat the game. And there are games certainly where that doesn't feel good. But here it actually, it, it's the opposite. It actually feels good because that's part of the game design that I think you guys went with. So talk to me a little bit about that rarity piece and how the idea of pay to win versus, you know, um, pay to own. I think that's that's a phrase that is, is bandied about these days uh, with, with a lot of Web3 games. But you guys are leaning into that pay to win piece and the rarity piece in a way that actually feels good. And I want to hear from you directly, Brian, like how, how are you guys doing that? Um, and, and how did it come to be? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe just to jump back on the previous question um, where Devin uh, had a great, great um, um, insight into the scouting, the collecting. I absolutely loved it. That's that's exactly it. So the 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 way, the simple way we kind of frame it is, you know, this the game loop is composed of four steps um, that you know loop and loop and loop again. The first one is you come, you, you scout. Like the, it, there's this massive scouting. Uh, element to it, as Devin said, and then based on your scouting, then you collect, um, and based on how you collect, you basically compose then your lineups. And you know, you've got a team of ten people of ten players. You have to you know field five uh, players. You compose your lineup depending on what you know what's going to happen in real life that weekend, and that's where there's a lot of extra game mechanics that come into in, to, in play in Sower that we don't control. That is basically controlled by what's happening in the real life. It's, is this player going to play? You know, is this uh, player being transferred to another club and then hence going to play for another club? There's like there's so many things that are happening in the real life that make the Sower experience so much better that in that that is, you know, fancy sports. But so scout, collect, compose your lineup and enjoy the live experience. And so that comes back to the idea of fancy, of, you know, owning these players, having bought and collected these cards, being connected through this purchase, through this collection to the player, to the moment where he's playing in real life, you're watching him on television or in the stadium. And, you know, what he does in real life will affect your performance um, in the game and based on, you know, who you select as all your players, um, if they perform in real life uh, for you um, and, um, you know, then you will be ranked um, in the leaderboard and depending on your ranking in that leaderboard, you will potentially earn uh, rewards and these rewards can be, um, you know, new cards, can be um, some experiences. So, for instance, um, in in during the uh, the, the global uh, cup that happened last year in football, uh, people that won our global cup game, um, the top five, they were able to play after with Zinedine Zidane, like have a whole day with him, uh, go to like VIP in Marseille, like kind of the the dream of any football player, to be honest. Um, and so, for us, it's like really kind of connecting your digital fandom with your physical fandom um, through this item that is, you know, the collectible, the NFT, right? Um, and so, so again, the, the simple gameplay or, or game loop is, you know, scout and collect, compose your lineup, enjoy the live experience and earn rewards. Um, and on and on and on and on and you repeat that. Um, and since football changes every single moment, every single minute, uh, there's a transfer, there's a new game, that w- that's, that's what makes it a kind of a forever game um, to some extent, right? Um, so that's the first thing. Um, on the scarcity elements and, and the pay to win aspect that you were mentioning, um, I'll first start by saying Sora is free to play. <laughs> I just want to make that statement because it is it is the case and it's true. It's free to play. And there's basically, I would say, two routes for you to play the game. There's one route that is purely free to play. Um, like any game, you can grind your way up um, and through that free-to-play aspect, you can actually win cards that are backed by, um, you know, non fungible tokens and non fungible technology. Hence, scarce, scarce cards. Um, and 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 through these curse cards, um, you know, start playing other types of competitions that kind of grind your way up. Um, you know, it'll take some time, um, but it's like in any other kind of game. And so that's the, the simple game mechanic that you can see in any free to play game. And then you can pay to go faster in different types of game modes. Um, um, and and that's if you collect specific types of cards, etc. Um, I think you know the the there. There's a balance um, uh, that is important to find 
for us so that SOAR is a skill-based uh, game, which is the case in most fancy games because, um, you know, the, the, the biggest, the kind of flagship competition today in SOAR is, is a competition called Cap 240. Um, and in Cap 240, you have to, so you have to bring players that have a maximum of 240 points in the last like five games. And that kind of creates an equal level playing field, a uh, level playing field for all players. And so that makes it 100% a skill-based game. And then you have, you know, some other competitions where indeed like it's more open. And um, I would say, um, you know, the better the players you collect, uh, the more chances you have to potentially like score really high scores in these in these competitions. So I would say, you know, for us, it's a, it's a, it's an act of balancing between different types of strategies. Would it be the free to play one? Would it be the the skill based one uh, or potential other routes? Um, and um, yeah, we we I think at the end of the day, this game economy is 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 always hard to get, um, but what we're trying to do is is to make it as accessible and as exciting as possible for any type of new user coming in. Um, and in the context of maybe Web3, where we will work, is I would say in a context that's independent of what's happening in the world of Web3. Would we be in a bull market, in a bear market? That shouldn't matter within the, the Sora game. What should only matter is your skill set, your scouting ability, your coaching ability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's kind of the most interesting aspect for me from my perspective is people that love playing Sora are people that love the idea of potentially one day becoming a coach or like a, a general manager. Um, and through playing Sora, they kind of get a feel of what that could be. Um, Earlier today, I'm sorry, I'm doing long answers, but earlier today I was speaking to uh, a, a team of, of managers who kind of uh, uh, partnered together and they built a, a tool called Data Scout. Um, and it's a tool that help um, basically like discover great football players around the world. And they're now trying to sell that tool to different football clubs and different agents um, in the football world. And all these guys, they started this because this tool helped them as a decision-making tool in their sort of scouting. And now it's becoming a decision-making tool in the real world. And so I think these are the things that I'm pretty excited about is how, how um, you know, we can bridge, you know, like the, the gaming and, 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 and the professional world of, of football management. The same way, you know, Nico, you as a football manager fan, the game, uh, recently a coach uh, called Will Still, who's 30 mm -hmm. years old, became mm -hmm. uh, yep. was a massive football manager player and became, you know, coach of a League One team. I think, Absolutely. you know, that that story will happen with server managers. And that's something that I'm really excited about because... These are the dreams of the, these are the types of dreams that our players have uh, when they play this game. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what I see with so rare. And I think part of the sustainability piece is the fact that you guys are truly through and through football fans, right? And you you value realism just like football manager does. I, my one of my geeky. I used to work for Ernst and Young. I was an auditor in a previous life in, in the UK, and uh, one year football manager the the, the founders of it, um, Stan and Oliver Collier, they won the Entrepreneur of the Year Award, um, which Ernst & Young sponsors. So if hopefully our listeners and you guys will indulge me on this little side journey here. Um, and Stan and Oliver Collier don't like publicity. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever even seen a photo of them. But Miles Jacobson, who's their general manager, who they brought in to do the business side of things, uh, and he's still there, um, he got to meet him. And so I was like, kind of geeky, like, Oh my God, you know, I got to meet my heroes, uh, the, the founders of this, this, this company or this game that I've been playing for, for literally 30 years. Um, and, uh, what was very clear to me about them is, is very similar to what you're saying here, Brian, which is there is this incredible passion for realism and actually mirroring like what is real these players in the world that are actually playing, they're human beings, they're players on teams. Um, and then what you guys have in your game, that realism of like, okay, we want to reflect what the real world is doing. So the stats need to be accurate, right? Um, if they're 
you mentioned, if they transfer from a team to another, like that obviously has to be reflected in, in the game. Um, and you're really going after that um, football fan that's really deep into realism, into the stats, into the real world, watching their, their, their favorite players play. So anyway, sorry for the little detour, but that's what I'm hearing from you, Brian. Um, and that's what I've been seeing from the outside. And that's what I saw from Devin's analysis as well, which is part of the reason I think that so rare has been sustainable up until this point is that, that mission to capture the realism um, of what you're actually representing, which is real players, real world, real clubs, real results, right? And so, that's the, you know, just to jump at this, that's the power of mm, IP also, right? right? You know, you exactly. through the IP, we are able to bring emotion into the game yep. and to, you know, have people that decide to play this game because it, 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 provi- it, it provides them this type of emotion of collecting, um, you know, an amazing, I don't know what's your team, Nico, but, you know, maybe, you know, we, we launched legend cards of a Finnish player called, um, uh, Yari Lippmanen. Um, oh, of course, and, Yari Lippmanen, um, maybe, yes. Legend, yes. And so maybe, legend in Finland. Legend, uh, le- well, literally also legend in the Sower gameplay and in, as a Sower card. So we have the Yari Lippmanen, um, legend card. And I think, you know, if you were playing Sower, I don't know if you are, but you probably would have bought that card just because you, um, are from Finland. And so, right. you know, like, you know, that emotional connection can, I think is, 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 is super important in the context of, of, of this game. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I, and that's why I'm a Liverpool fan, by the way. So my team is Liverpool <laughs> and Yari yes. Lippen, of course, played for Liverpool. And, uh, that's how I originally became it. So that's my team. I, I know it's a, now it's a cheat in football manager because obviously the team is so good, but you know, about, six or seven seasons ago w- was not a cheat. It was, it was hard work grinding up with, with Liverpool. Um, okay. So, um, so Devin, I'm going to dive in here. So we just talked about the, the, the commitment and the passion to, you know, the real life football being the starting point, obviously, you know, there are other sports and, you know, you noted in your piece, Devin, that so rare is actually working with uh, new leagues. I think we've got MLB and NBA, um, obviously much smaller than, than football. Um, but I guess my question to you, Devin, and then we'll, we'll get back to you, Brian, is the passion for football is clear, right? I think that we can all see that. It, it's hard to do multiple sports, um, my opinion. Um, and so, Devin, from your perspective as the analyst, the looking you know outside in, uh, how successful has the expansion? I think we can call it that into NBA and MLB. Uh, and Brian can talk if there's any other sports on, on the horizon. Um, how successful do you think that has been um, with that lens of hey, we're really true to the sport that we're we're going for? C- can you do it for multiple sports? Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, it's kind of funny too because it's like uh, while football may have like a, a big huge fan base or soccer rather, just to clarify because of what I'm going to say, uh, mm-hmm. you know, worldwide, it, as far as ranking uh, fantasy sports goes, American football is actually generally at the top than baseball and mm-hmm. and and, uh, and basketball. So soccer is actually not one of the top ones. So bringing in baseball and, and basketball is actually really big from the fantasy angle, right? Because especially baseball is such a stat driven game where where the, the kind of fans obsess over that stuff like like I referenced Moneyball earlier is like a good touch point for that and it's and so it's it's something that really appeals to them and so I think it's it's a great uh, sport to bring into this and the basketball as well has a, a huge amount of, of appeal to to a different demographic as, as well and the, the difficult part here is adapting, I think, the, the the games. And so for what I've seen so far, right, like the games are relatively newer. And so like I see just looking at like secondary market prices and things like that, a little bit lower, right? But but I could see that there's clearly some traction, but it requires acquiring somewhat of a new audience. Whereas like so rare, the, the, the soccer side has been around for a while and obviously has a lot of players. And so it'll take some time, I think, to get the, them there. But like I said, as far as fantasy sports go and trading cards go, like baseball, you know, is, is a shoe. And I think as long as the marketing can reach those players and get them to come in and have them do something besides maybe other types of fantasy sports that they're doing, I think that's an easy sell. And, and basketball as well, I think could follow, as you mentioned, Top Shot earlier was a great example of that fan base potentially being uh, something they would be interested in because you can't do anything with those moments as you mentioned earlier, the difficult part, of course, is you do have to adapt to the game, right? Like there's Mm. the basic game of like, you pick a lineup, 
and you put put that lineup in, right? That's that doesn't necessarily have to change too much, right? Because even esports can do that, right? You see like League of Legends versions where you're like, oh, this dude's this position, this position, this position like, is the carrier, that is the jungle. Like, there, there's ways to translate it, but you do have to see some differences. So, like for example, the baseball one, you have to field a bigger team, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because it it supports more teams in different positions, and that requires more cards. Right, so there is a little bit of some difference in terms of collecting between those, and then you also have to think about the the scoring systems are very different between those games. Like uh, on one end of the spectrum, soccer sometimes like y- you see like a one zero game, right? Like there's a one point score the whole game, and on the other extreme end, basketball like goes into the hundreds. Uh, you know, it's like 120s is, is not an unusual in a game. Then you have baseball so kind of somewhere in the middle, right? And so like all those kind of different factors have to be translated into how you do the scoring systems, how you how you balance out the players, how you handle caps. So all that stuff, I imagine, will take some time as well to get correct. But fantasy sports have been doing those sports for a while, so I don't think it's like that hard to look at what those other ones are doing and adapt it. But I do think it'll be interesting to see over time like how they kind of shift uh, you know, the, the different sports to fit the, the audience and the, the collectability aspect being different than the typical fantasy sports where, like I said, like with the baseball one, you actually have to have a bigger collection potentially to field more teams as opposed to like a fantasy sports game where you just, it's just a budget and it doesn't matter how many you like have. And so I think those differences will probably manifest a bit over time uh, and, and have to be worked out. But you, you know, as I'm sure Brian can speak to, there's, there's starter packs, there's the, the free cards that you get when you start out. There's plenty of ways to kind of help, you know, uh, mitigate that to an extent, but the differences I think will, you know, come out over time uh, in more than just prices. Yeah, Brian, um, your thoughts on, obviously, they're newer, so, you know, uh, smaller, uh, I mean, not smaller sports, they're huge sports, obviously, to, to Devin's point, um, but, you know, they're smaller as, as a, a line of business so far. Um, how are you guys at Sower thinking about expansion into these new sports, and how do you think you can stay true to the passion you clearly have for the, the football, soccer side of things? with these, these new sports, like how are you structuring your teams? You know, some of that, in, I hate to use this phrase inside baseball, um, cause we're talking about baseball here, but like, um, what's the inside track uh, at so rare on how you guys are, are thinking about making sure that you do justice, uh, to these new sports, because again, to Devin's point, bigger lineups, different scoring, you know, different rules, different fan base, right? You can't just cross promote from your football soccer fans into baseball. Like it doesn't translate necessarily. So your thoughts, Brian, on, on how you guys are, are thinking about this. Yeah. Um, so I mean, Devin's point was, was spot on, um, in terms of, you know, all the differences in the gameplay. One that is also interesting is, uh, card population. Um, so if you think about it, you know, NBA, MLB, um, limited number of teams, um, you know, it's a closed league. You have, um, you know, 30 teams, et cetera, um, and, and a specific number of players in every single team. Um, with, with football, we have like 20 leagues. Um, and so far more players, meaning that um, since we have far more eligible players that we can create cards for, um, well, then we have to think differently in terms of um, how many how many cards should we print? What scarcity level should there be between like an NBA, an MLB, and a football game? And that would be true if you know, let's say tomorrow, hypothetically, we launch like a I don't know, like a tennis game or or whatnot. You know, how do you think about that card population? Also, so this is more on the you know gameplay aspect, which I think is you know interesting when you think about um, any sort of game. But 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 that's that's one aspect in terms of. You know, the fan base, how we how we kind of structure the way we work is, um, you know, football is our most mature product, mature product. Like, it, you know, it's been we launched it like four years ago. Um, we really found product market fit on that product. And, and, and it's a matter of like improving the products, making it um, more accessible, more exciting, more fun, um, more engaging. And, and so there's a there's a ton of work for, for years to come. But but it's we in a different, I would say phase of of the product life cycle um on the nba side of things and the mlb side of things you know we have first of all two very different sports um you know nba being a very global sport per nature um you know obviously very strong in the us uh, but also actually with with Wemby and 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 others you know very very international very european to some extent becoming more and more european um and so 
there is a lot of crossover between um, between uh, football and NBA. And what I'm really excited about with Sora is, you know, a lot of people play Sora and love the game so much that they're willing to jump into a new sport and maybe start Sora MLB just because they love Sora. They don't know anything about MLB um, and they're going to start playing, you know, Sora MLB and they're going to learn about MLB and, and potentially they will start collecting MLB cards and they'll start building a fandom for the, you know, whomever, the Yankees or whatever, uh, because they are, uh, because because of Sora, thanks to Sora, and so I think you know that's also quite interesting from the MLB perspective. Is saying, hey, how can like this partnership with Sora help me attract a new fan base uh, um, in a different, you know, a, based in Europe or based outside of the US, um, who might have not you know gone into MLB if it were, if it were not for Sora. So that's one thing. I think. Um, Second thing is obviously in terms of fan bases, like still for MLB, for instance, like the biggest MLB fan base is based in the US. And so there's a lot of work that we need to do as a company from a marketing standpoint and making sure that SOAR is um, a fantasy game um, that is you know different to the other kind of daily fantasy games you have in the US, but that is known and that, you know, uh, where we have that brand awareness that help us uh, drive that organic I would say flow of um, of of interest, um, and and since like the fancy market itself is very different between the US and Europe, um, you know when you say a fancy game in Europe, you think fancy Premier League or you think Fanta Calcio in Italy, you think you know these are purely free to play games. There's just no at all like money element in it. Um, it's like purely free to play, bragging rights. That's it. Um, again, fancy Premier League, like ten to fifteen million people playing. Lots of people in India. Lots of people in the UK, but lots of people all over the world. Um, if you think fancy game in in the US, you think you know DraftKings, FanDuel, very different type of gameplay. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, where you need a betting license, etc. Like where we sit is we're not a daily fancy game, and we more like a, a to be honest, we far more like a. Uh, uh, fancy Premier League game with the difference that, again, these players that you fielding in your team are cards that you can collect and trade. Um, um, and, and so and so that's the big difference. And I think, you know, it, since these markets are in different level of kind of maturity, understanding, uh, um, and, and different kind of product uh, products, well, we need to adapt our, you know, NBA, MLB product to different um, type of understanding these users might have. Um, I think what, in our case, what's challenging is we kind of creating a new product category uh, and a game category. And so with this comes uh, a lot of work on the um, education aspect of what's the game about, what is it like, et cetera. It's not like you're coming into a game category where you can say, oh, it's just like, it's just like, you know, FPL, um, but for the French league or for the Spanish league here, it's, it's different altogether. And so you need to start from scratch and you need to, to, to get, you know, we need, we need to do a lot of work in, in making sure that people can get it quickly um, mm-hmm. and can jump into it easily. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Devin, I know you had a follow-up comment on uh, multisports. Uh, yeah, so just, just something I, I forgot to mention earlier. Is, is, uh, it's also worth noting that because everything is based off real world play, uh, there's obviously the limitation of seasons, right? And so having multiple sports means potential for activity mm. during times when other sports are inactive. And so like spreading out the uh, the sports that you have kind of across the year allows, I think, for a little more consistent revenue potentially, you know, for the company and things like that. So it is something that's like important to making sure that there's consistent activity on the site and consistent revenue and you just consistent things flowing around, especially with the secondary market trading and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was actually, that was going to be, I had a, a question that I, I, I passed on earlier, but I'm going to bring it up now because that's actually a great point, Devin. If, you know, obviously uh, sports have off seasons, right? And right now we are in the football slash soccer off season. Um, Except if, in know, the U.S., Except in the U.S., right? Exactly. So um, I'm curious to hear uh, how you guys think about the off season in general. Not from a multi sports perspective, but like, hey, I'm playing so rare football, soccer. Uh, it's the middle of the summer uh, in the European leagues, which you know, is where most of the action is. Um, yeah. I don't have any games that are going on except for maybe European Championship or World Cup, but they only come around every four years. Uh, what are players doing 
in the offseason. Uh, how do you guys keep that engagement for players going when you are so tied to the real world, which we've talked about is an incredible strength because it ties you to that like, hey, weekly cadence of games um, that you're actually watching either in person or on TV. But it also breaks in some ways when the yeah. offseason rolls around. Yeah, 100%. So on the football side of things, um, so when the European season finishes, like right now, um, there's still a MLS, the Asian League, so, you know, K-League, J-League, all the South, South, um, South American leagues. So basically it's only Europe that's off and all the rest is on. So if you're like a massive, massive, massive football fan, like you're going you're gonna to find your way and you're going to start playing MLS or you're going to start playing K-League or J-League, etc. So it's actually like a great marketing trick from the MLS to some extent. i uh, not really sure it's done on purpose, but if you're a massive football fan, like, you know, you'll, you'll find interest in watching MLS and engaging with, with the MLS product. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, um, so I joined Sower like early 2020 and something happened in 2020 called COVID. Um, and COVID uh, from a sports perspective was a nightmare because suddenly you didn't have any sports events for you know a good six months, even more. So what does a fancy game with no sports events do? Uh, so that was an interesting moment because you had to... We had to reinvent the game altogether, um, but we were still a fancy game. And so what we did back then is we replayed <laughs> past seasons. And so what we were saying is, okay, we're going to, we're going to, um, uh, okay, there's no more football. Uh, we don't know when football's ever going to come back. Uh, and so what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to keep on this game week mechanic uh, of like, you know, you have four days where you have to wait. Uh, you'll see the scores pop up. But basically what's going to happen is we're going to select a previous match day, a game week from a previous season from last year. And so that's what we were doing is we're kind of replaying past game weeks, um, which actually made the game even more data driven in the sense that you knew, let's say that, okay, we're saying it's going to be the 20, it was going to be like the, the, the first half of the season plus the season before. And so now you knew that there was like a, a sample of maybe 50 different game weeks that, you know, your uh, players can be scored on. And so you could like, you know, analyze this, these 50 game weeks and say, okay, based on, you know, all my kind of data crunching, et cetera, like these are the players that I should, field in my team and then maybe like we had a thing where obviously if we had one game we would have been you know used we can't use it anymore and so now that changes you know the kind of best lineup that you could field and so even that just kind of created some some mechanics where you had to like you know change your your you had to collect different types of cards and players based on on that changing data right so um there are there are things that you can do um and off season, but obviously right now it's the NBA off season. The activity is is uh, on the NBA game is is uh, is pretty low, um, and and so the fact of having three different sports can help us. You know, if there's no NBA, maybe it's the time for you to tip your toes into football right now or into MLB. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, okay, so we're coming towards the end of our time here, but I have a question for both of you here, which is, uh, you know, it was part of my opening statement, which is, so where it looks to be a sustainable business, right? Uh, despite air quotes, <laughs> or because of, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, of its Web3 roots, uh, digital ownership and, and embracing blockchain technologies. Uh, and, and, you know, my segment for the Navic podcast is very Web3 focused. So I want to talk about sustainability here um, and hear it from you both. So Devin, we'll start with you. As you looked into SoRare and and you made that statement like, hey, SoRare looks to be a sustainable business, obviously down a little bit because of, of crypto winter and, and what have you, but nonetheless, still a very uh, healthy looking business, uh, certainly from the outside looking in. Uh, what do you think SoRare is doing right and how does it avoid some of the other pitfalls that that other Web3 games, especially the ones that are leaning heavily into play to earn, um, are, are, are doing? Uh, where does SoRare, from your perspective as the analyst that's looking in, go from here uh, in a sustainable fashion? Uh, how does it grow even further from its Web3 roots and goes to mainstream? I mean, it, it goes back to some of the things Brian was talking about. 
uh, which ultimately this isn't a Web3 game. This is a, a, a fantasy game with digital collectibles that happens to use Web3 technology to facilitate that, to facilitate both the trading and ownership aspect and some of the financial aspects. But at the end of the day, like I'll, almost everything about this game could potentially be done in a Web2 environment. And I know that's often an argument against Web3, right? But this is, you know, using Web3 technology correctly, which is to say, like, it's enhancing the experience by opening it up rather than closing it, but not trying to do anything overly gimmicky with that. It's not trying to, like, uh, try and do weird, tricky tokenomics stuff. It's just like, hey, like, we tried to facilitate some ways to make this all work using the blockchain so that you guys can freely do what you want to do with this stuff. And we're going to help build around that and make sure that, like, this is a fun experience. And it's, like, it's fun to own these cards and do things with them. And then potentially maybe other things can happen with these cards also. And I think like that's that's a great way to look at it. And I think in terms of growth, like that's one option to look at it. It's like how do we grow this outside just our core gameplay? What are some of the things we could do? Like Brian's touching on about what what they're doing with the off season, for example. Uh, like there's different ways to look at. Okay, well we've got people owning these cards. Can we drive different types of ownership? Can we go? Okay, well maybe you want to buy cards for a different reason than just to play this particular season. Like you're talking about. Oh, you you you're playing the off season games, like the the ones that were previous games. You start to shop differently. You start to scout differently. And so looking at opportunities for different buying patterns, different ways for for them to uh, get people to collect in different ways. I think is always the way for to make us like a collectible based game more sustainable is to, I, I call it thinking horizontally. You want to broaden people's collection and give them incentives to do so. And I think there's plenty of opportunity for them to do that. And luckily, like fantasy sports are an evergreen thing, right? Like this, unless the sports themselves go away, which is very unlikely, uh, there's always like a base for their game. And it's just a matter of like how well that's managed. And it sounds like from what I've seen and from what Brian said, it's been done very well so far. And as long as they don't kind of like get overly confused about what they're doing and keep their eyes on the prize. I, I think it's it's very easy to continue to grow with it, uh, assuming some legal aspect doesn't come in like and her things. And I know like, for example, there was, you know, the issues around the, the French government stuff with, uh, you know, the, the the cup, stuff like that. But you guys dealt with it. And I think keep doing that should be fine. Brian, your thoughts. Um, no, I, I, you know, great analysis, Devin. Appreciate it. You kind of <laughs> said it all. Um, but um you know, I think um, there's what I'm excited about is 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 indeed um, giving more uh, pathways into why you would collect some of these cards. Would it be the fancy game? Would it be the collectible game that we have? Would it be um, you know just like being able to uh, proudly show your 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 you know football digital identity? Like I'm a Maradona fan, let me collect Maradona cards and like show this to my friends and be proud about it, you know. Um, and this maybe comes back to a bit more what NBA Top Shot was doing. Why were people buying um, or are still buying, um, you know, Top Shots? Because like I want to show that I'm a massive, I don't know, like um, uh, NBA and specifically like San Antonio Spurs fan, for instance. Um, so I think I think that that's an exciting and like an exciting uh, aspect for us. Like the other one is which is kind of the holy grail of to some extent web through gaming is like how can these items can be how can these items be used outside of like just like Sower's game, right? And 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 so we've had some exciting experiments around that and I think fielded by the idea that, you know, these items can be used anywhere by any by any by anyone however they want, because we don't control these one, these items when they're sold and they're out there in the open. And so, you know, we, we have a company called, um, we don't have it, it's called Sora Data, it's created independently where you can scout, um, look for numbers, et cetera. They do competitions that are different type of fancy competitions. There was one called Sora Mega, Sora Brag, um, um, you know, other kind of third party apps being built on top of Sora. And I think that's, for me, quite exciting is the idea of thinking like, hey, this thinking very differently than I would say Web2 Gaming where like, hey, my incentive is for you to stay in this game as much as possible and consume everything in the game. Whereas I think for me, what what the day will really win um, truly in a massive way is is when um, as um, a, an owner of the Sora cards, um, I can participate in multiple different types of experiences, not only built by Sora, but built by third-party mm -hmm. apps. Um, and so that's true if you give, you know, kind of, I don't know, discounting utility through Sora card, you can get like a 10% discount 
um, in a Real Madrid shop if you have a Real Madrid player. Um, that's true if, let's say, you have a retired player um, such as Yari Litmanen um, in, your, in your wallet, but actually someone built a team for retired players, uh, sorry, a game for retired players where it's like kind of earth stone uh, mixed with football cards. Um, and, you know, this is the type of game that you could build on top of Sower um, and, 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 you know, you can, you can potentially one day make a business out of it. Um, and you can actually kind of hack your way into a user base just by saying, hey, like, you know, Sower has like, I don't know, three, 300, 400,000, um, you know, paying users right now. Like, you know, I'm going to build a game for these guys. And, you know, if I can bring only like just 50,000 people to my game um, and like have a way to like, you know, monetize this through like boosts, et cetera, et cetera, well, then you have a viable business here. And so I think for me, that's what's exciting is like kind of the ultimate long-term view of like, the card as a platform rather than like mm. the game is the platform. Um, mm. and, and, and yeah, that's particularly exciting, but I think it's a very long-term, long-term view within the context of where Web3 Gaming is today. Um, and maybe just to finish on the play to earn aspect, like we've never used that word. Uh, yeah, no. uh, and you know, it may, it might be something that's cool to, that's okay to say in 2023. It was, uh, but it's, it's, we were saying the same thing in 2021. Uh, it's really about, uh, Playing, uh, playing for fun, playing to own uh, or playing to win, but it's not about playing to earn. Um, and so uh, that's that's ultimately like what will make a game sustainable. Um, and so that's why I'm finishing on that part. Yeah, no, I, and, and you're preaching to the choir here, I'm sure. <laughs> I won't speak for Devin necessarily, but I see him nodding his head. So no, absolutely. Like the play, play to earn to me never really made much sense either. Uh, to earn, like that's a job, right? That's not a, not a game. The, the word uh, earn gets so misused. Yeah, I, I just, the, yeah, I agree. Yeah, even in the loyalty programs, right? Like earning is just spending money. Yeah, 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 yeah. true. Um, but uh, the, the, the final note I'm just going to pick on here from what you just said, Brian, which is, you know, the cards as a platform. I, I love that idea. I love that vision because that's, as a fo- lifelong football manager, championship manager, player, that's exactly how I think about that game. It, like every single player card, they're not c- called cards there, but like, you know, the, the, the view that you get when you have all the stats, right? Um, that to me is the ultimate in kind of football fandom slash football gaming, right? When you combine the two. Um, and I love the idea that so rare's cards, which are officially licensed and presumably living and breathing, you know, updated, you know, uh, as the players transfer from club to club and, and make, you know, their way through their careers. Um, if you as a, as a player actually owns that card and can create different kinds of gaming experiences or even non-gaming experiences, right? Like ex- experiential experiences, you know, discounts in stores or access to that player or whatever, access to that club. Um, that to me, and, and that travels with you forever, right? Like it's your digital ownership you know, that that's the rights that you get that are associated with it. That to me is incredibly powerful. Right. And so to, to me, the, sh- the long and the short of it is like, if we were to say, why do I think that so rare has a chance to be one of the most sustainable. And again, I know you don't think of yourself as a purely web three business, but you are obviously leaning into web three technologies. Why do I think you could be one of the most sustainable players out there companies out there? It's because of that piece right? Which is like the true digital ownership of something that actually exists in the real world. Like it's, it's perfect to me. That's the perfect match for web three and, you know, digital, uh, digital and real world connection. Um, so anyway, on that note, I know we're, we're actually over time. So I appreciate you guys staying a little bit late here. Uh, so we're going to wrap it up here. I had so many more questions. Um, but, uh, we'll have to have you come back, uh, a, a different time to talk about, uh, talk about those things. So Devin, Brian, thank you so much, both of you. Devin, thank you for writing the piece. It was a great eye-opening piece. I encourage everybody to go Novic Digest. Uh, We'll put the link in the show notes. Brian, thank you so much for coming on and and sharing your insights. Um, And again, I really feel the passion for (laughs) what you guys are doing for football, you know, soccer fandom and digital owner. Like to me, it's, it's, it's one of the purest expressions of somebody who cares <laughs> about what they're doing, what they're building. And that clearly understands um, the depth of the fandom, the depth of the passion for, you know, what football fans really care about, such as myself, for example. <laughs> so <laughs> Evan, Brian, thank you so much, both of you. Thanks a million, Nico. Thank you. 
And as always, a big thank you to all of our listeners. We'll be back next week with more interviews, more insights, and more analysis from the weird and wonderful world of Web3 and gaming more broadly. So until next time, friends, stay crypto curious and feel free to send questions, guest recommendations, and comments to me. My email is nico at navic.co and you can find me on Twitter, nico the fin. DMs always open. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.